Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third joint live stream between the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington at Mount Vernon and the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. I'm Jim Ambusky of the Washington Library Center for Digital History, and I'm excited to serve as your maitre d' for this event. A reminder that you can see our two previous joint streams featuring Dr. Laura Sandy discussing overseers and early American slavery and Dr. Frank Cogliano, who tackled Washington and Jefferson's complicated relationship. And you can see these by going to our respective YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter channels. Today, we're delighted to bring you conversations with four emerging scholars who are doing cutting edge work in the field of early American history. They are coming to you from across the country and indeed from across the Atlantic to share their insights with you this afternoon. We wanna get right to it, so let me give you a sense of what's to come. Over the next hour or so, you'll hear from two research fellows from each library who will be in conversation with our respective directors, first with Dr. Andrew O'Shaughnessy of the ICJS and then Dr. Kevin Butterfield of the Washington Library. And I encourage all of you watching us live to think about the connections between our guest research and to post your questions and comments on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, because in the final segment of today's program, I'll come back to moderate a discussion amongst all four fellows using your questions and comments as inspiration. So without further ado, it is my pleasure then to welcome Dr. Andrew O'Shaughnessy, the Saunders Director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. Andrew, take it away. Well, thank you, Jim, and welcome to our audience. I'm frequently asked uh, what's left to study and to find out about Thomas Jefferson George Washington and the period of the early Republic. Today, we shall see some examples from scholars still in the early stages of their academic careers. I'm introducing two of them who both recently held fellowships at Monticello and at Mount Vernon. They will each, as Jim said, speak for about five to seven minutes, followed by five minutes of conversation with me, and then I'm going to hand over to Kevin Butterfield, my counterpart at Mount Vernon. There'll be opportunities at the end for the audience to ask questions which can be entered in the chat box. So let me begin first with Alexi Garrett, who recently completed her doctorate at UVA and is currently at Thomas Paine Institute and UVA postdoctoral fellow at Iona College. Alexi, welcome. Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here today and to listen to my fellow peers work and excited for the audience questions too. So if you don't mind, I think I'll start chatting about my research. Absolutely. So, yeah, thank you. So I wanted to talk about my research today that I am uh, turning into a book currently. But I also, as a part of my short talk today, wanted to give our audience a little peek into the historian's craft or kind of the methods that we historians use to find the stories about the people we write about. So uh, Jeanette, if you could pull up the first slide, please. So I just wanted to show everyone some sources today that I used for my research and uh, hopefully they'll illuminate a little bit of the story that I'm going to tell. So. When I started this research, I was in my second year at UVA and I needed a master's project and I found this 1000 page court case where a woman who was never married and who owned two nail manufactories, one in Alexandria, Virginia and one in Michigan, Virginia, and she was getting sued because uh, the, 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 the details of this, the suit don't really matter, but she was a rich woman who was the largest um, slave owner of Essex County uh, Virginia in the 1790s and 1800s. And her name is Catherine Flood McCall, and she is the subject of my dissertation turned manuscript. Now, Kate Flood McCall lived from 1766 to 1828. So her entire life, she experienced the events leading to the American Revolution, the American Revolution, and the aftermath of the war and living in the new, new United States. And she again, never got married, which meant she was a very distinctive woman for her time in early national Virginia. And so I wanted to show you a little bit um, about her on the screen. If you look on the upper portion, you'll see her signature, C.F. McCall. And this is on one of the letters she wrote to her nail manufacturing manager. So this court case had many documents 
where she where she was the manager of this um, nail manufactory in Richmond and Alexandria that employed enslaved labor. So she would hire out enslaved people and she would also use her own enslaved people as blacksmiths here. And so um, one of my arguments is that women were not paper owners of enslaved people back then. That doesn't mean, that means that they didn't hold enslaved people just in name only and men did management work. Women did all the management work as well. So I also wanted to point out to you uh, the left hand side, you'll see in the middle, this is a tax list and you'll see Kath F. McCall down there. And she is one of the largest slave owners in Essex County and she's uh, the ninth largest overall and the largest female slave owner for most of her life. You can see there she's owning 29 enslaved people in 1800. Also, I wanted to show you the house that she lived in that's still standing today. And it's currently um, St. Margaret's Boarding School and it's located in Tappahannock, Virginia. And I actually got to stay, stay the night there while I was doing research and I can talk to you about some ghost stories I have to share later with the audience. And then finally, the other, um, the other document I want to show is that Kate McCall was a businesswoman. Not only did she own and manage enslaved people uh, at the nail manufactory, but she also rented out her own enslaved people um, to neighbors for uh, temporary hire. So this is a document kind of in the middle there saying um, she's suing a man named George Engels for not returning her enslaved woman named Chris to her with the proper stockings and clothing that he promised. So again, one of the reasons Kate McCall is able to engage in such business transactions, such as owning her own enslaved property, owning her own businesses, and suing and being sued by others in court is because she never got married. Uh, she was a femme soul, single lady. And that means um, legally back then before Married Women's Property Acts were enacted state by state starting in the 1840s. Married women, uh, which were over 90% of women in early America, legally were subsumed under their husband's names. Whereas unmarried women, so never married or widowed women, could act in their own accord um, legally. So she is a very special case for not getting married and for using her power as a femme soul and her inheritance from her rich grandpa to uh, enact her businesswoman wishes. So next slide, please. I'd also like to show you um, some more examples uh, of documents related to her. So because Catherine was a woman and a business owner, she still had to abide by early American norms of femininity. So if you look in the upper right-hand corner, this is an advertisement she had her father take out for her for her nail manufactory. So you'll see his name is Archibald McCall, and this is an advertisement from 1811, and that is her father. And because she's a woman, she doesn't want to put her own name on such a masculine enterprise in the public sphere, right? A masculine enterprise as nail making with the dirty, hot, steamy work that it entails. And so she still has to abide by rules of femininity, even though she's a true owner of this nail manufactory. So she relies on her father to do the advertisements for her. Uh, we also have on the left uh, a 1782 second edition Encyclopedia uh, Britannica set that I found from a local owner in Virginia that I'd love to talk about later, but we don't have time now. So if anyone has questions on that, happy to answer them. And one of the most exciting things I found out about Kate McCall that will be featured in the book is that her nail manufactory in Richmond directly competed with the nail manufactory set up at the brand new Virginia State Penitentiary. The Virginia State Penitentiary was built in 1800, but finally became profitable in 1807. And it was founded with revolutionary ideals, such as uh, thinking that we can reform criminals through honest work. And so the Virginia State Penitentiary set up different types of workshops for different goods. And the very first workshop they set up was a nail manufactory because you can make many nails relatively cheaply and pretty quickly for sale. And so she, uh, Catherine Flood McCall and her father directly competed with the Virginia State Penitentiary. And I'm hopefully going to argue that ironically during Jefferson's era of private business, uh, the Virginia State Penitentiary, a taxpayer supported state owned operation actually undersold all private nail manufactories in Richmond by 1815, which is highly ironic given 
um, the idea in the earlier public of the ability for each man or woman in this case to be his or her own, her own business owner without much state competition. So overall, in my dissertation research, I'm featuring Catherine Flood McCall as my main character. She's a distinctive woman for her time. She relied on enslaved labor and inheritance to make herself powerful, especially in an early American community that really wanted women to be married and women to be settled down and expected women's dependence. And so her independence was because she did not get married and because she relied on enslaved labor. So this is an interesting story about her. I'm also comparing her to other slave owning women in Virginia at this time, including one of Patrick Henry's sisters, Annie Henry Christian, as well as the very famous um, Martha Washington, George Washington's wife, who I think many of us tuning in know about. So happy to talk about all three women that are featuring in my dissertation and book. And overall, I'm arguing that it's unmarried women uh, who live in a patriarchal society and a slave owning society that are able to gain power, economic independence in such a dependent society through enslaved labor. So I don't think that these women could be as rich and powerful as they were in their communities without relying on enslaved labor. So thank you very much. I'm excited for the questions and I'm excited to hear about our other colleagues' research. Well, thank you. And uh, just to remind everyone, the audience will be able to ask questions towards the end of all of these presentations. I'm just going to ask you a few, though, now that might be on people's minds. Uh, sure. We've had studied plantation mistresses since at least the 1960s. I, I think of uh, Elizabeth Fox Genovese. But is this really the first study of women as plantation owners, unmarried women as plantation owners? This is not the first study of mm. unmarried women as plantation owners because there's just been a lot of work already on Martha Washington, who was a widow twice in her life. We also have a work, uh, work by Tavolia uh, Glimpse that talks about how mistresses during the antebellum period in the South overall were um, married or unmarried and who uh, exerted power and violence over in their enslaved people. So there's a rich literature on that, but what there's not a rich literature on are unmarried women owning pre-industrial enterprises, right? So this, so the 1800s, 1820s, this is uh, the era before the Industrial Revolution really took off. There's no railroads yet, right? And we have this, what I'm calling a proto-industrial enterprise as this blacksmithing operation that a woman is owning. And we also have Annie Henry Christian, like I mentioned earlier, she's owning a salt mine on what was then the Virginia frontier and what is now modern day Louisville, Kentucky. And she was a widow who took that over from her husband and ran it at a profit. And then we have Martha, who's more of a traditional um, plantation mistress, but she also has to deal with George's whiskey distillery and fishing operation as a widow after his death. And so we have women dealing with estate management activities, property, business management activities, either as never married or as widows. And so I think my research is um, more distinctive in that we're looking at women's involvement with proto-industrial enterprises, not just plantation enterprises. And are you yet uh, able to make any generalizations to see any differences between male owners uh, or, or are they in many ways much the same? Yeah, th no, so, so it's a gendered argument either way, whether they're similar or different to men. And so they're quite similar to men in that they're very capable in telling others what to do as owners, right? De delegating um, instructions to white overseers at the sites of production. So Annie is telling, is writing instructions to white overseers at the salt mine. And Catherine is writing instructions to overseers at the nail manufactories in Alexandria and Richmond. And Martha Washington is also working through um, kind of agricultural managers at Mount Vernon to um, make things happen after, after George's death. Um, what makes them different is that they do not want to um, show up too much in the public eye in this masculine role as business owner, industrial manager. So I mentioned that earlier example of Kate not wanting to put her name on advertisements to the public for her nail wares. But we also have um, 
Martha working a little bit more behind the scenes and not putting things so publicly. Other men take take that on for her when it comes to advertisements and the sale of property after George and her first husband's death. And then with Annie, it's quite interesting. We have a couple of letters between her and her mother where she'll say, oh, woe is me, my husband has died and I have no idea how to run the salt mining business. I, I don't know the first thing about business. But then in the exact same letter, she'll say, I paid so-and-so this debt, so-and-so owes me this much, this many bushels of salt went to so-and-so. So she actually is delegating in, uh, uh, the business and knows everything about the business. So I think it really goes to show that um, women, elite women have this notion of propriety that they have to uphold in the public eye. They have to stay away from what is deemed the masculine world of quarter industrial enterprise, but they actually are running it well and in educated ways, um, more behind the scenes that their family all know about, but perhaps the public is a, is a little less aware of. So we've really run out of uh, time pretty well. Um, Again, people will have other opportunities to ask you questions. I did, though, have a very quick question, which I hopefully can answer briefly, which is I've always been confused. What is that when George Washington freed his slaves, he was unable to free the slaves of uh, Martha. And I would have thought uh, with her being subsumed uh, in a marriage that that would mm -hmm. have been a problem. Mm -hmm. So that is an interesting case that kind of gets wrapped up in early American legalese. So the best way to describe that is that when Martha married her first husband um, and then her first husband died, she technically did not inherit all of the acres and enslaved people from her first husband, Daniel, but she controlled it while living until his heirs, their two children reached adulthood to then take it over. But one, um, one of her children died, and one of the, the only heir that actually could claim this was Jackie, and he did live to adulthood. But Jackie was still a young child. He was, he was a minor when she married George. And so then George controlled all of the late Daniel's property, but again, did not technically own it. So then, and George brought his own enslaved people and property to the marriage. So after George died, he could not free Martha's slaves because they were actually Daniel's enslaved people that belonged to his children. And so there was lots of family squabbles about who gets which enslaved person or family um, after the death of both Martha and George, which broke up many intermarried from Daniel's families, enslaved people and George's enslaved people that had lived at the Mount Vernon plantation for many years and intermarried with each other and they were split apart quite brutally um, after Martha and George's death. So I hope that explains it a little bit, but I'm happy to go into it. Uh, uh, although it's more uh, complicated than I had imagined, but thank you very much. You're welcome. Indeed. Thank, you. thank you. We'll come back to you later. I now have uh, Michael uh, Blackman with me, who's an assistant professor at Princeton University and is currently the Fritz and Claudine Kundrun One Year Fellow at Monticello. And he's, current, he's working on a book called Speculation Nation, Land Mania in Re the Revolutionary American Republic. And again, uh, he'll be speaking for between five and seven minutes, followed by a short conversation with me. And later the audience will have an opportunity to talk. So welcome, Michael. Thanks so much, Andrew. It's it's great to be here. Um, I'm, I'm really thankful for the opportunity today to learn about what my fellow fellows are working on and for the chance to share a sort of preview of my own forthcoming book. Um, it's really been a, a privilege over the course of my grad school career and my first few years as a professor to be affiliated with the libraries at Monticello and Mount Vernon. The houses themselves, of course, are you know two of the most significant historic structures around. They're monuments to revolutionary ideals. They're also testaments to, as plantations, testaments to the centrality of slavery in the American founding, something I think Alexi's work gets to really significantly. So as a sort of an homage to these two institutions that have been so important to me, uh, uh, over the years and which do so much for the field of early American history, I thought I'd bring in kind of a third 18th century house to use as a touchstone for my uh, for my remarks today. 
This is less famous than Monticello and Mount Vernon. As you can see, it's certainly less symmetrical than Monticello and Mount Vernon, but I think it's no less telling as a place and as a structure. So this, uh, this rambling and kind of ostentatious house, it sits in a tranquil village in Connecticut, a um, small village called Suffield. And in the late 18th century, this house was owned by a man named Oliver Phelps. Phelps had started out in life as a tavern keeper. During the Revolutionary War, he was a commissary selling provisions to the Continental Army. And in 1788, he, he joined a partnership um, with a Massachusetts politician to purchase the government claim to 6 million acres of land, unceded Iroquois land, um, which today is much of Western New York for $1 million. That year, 1788, it was also the year that Phelps bought this house. It was a house to kind of match his mounting prospects, you know, to, to announce that he was a man on the rise. Um, and on, upon moving in, he kind of made some tweaks to try to drive that message home. You can see on uh, the left corner of the house, those sort of wooden blocks resembling stonework. Phelps had those added all around the house in order to sort of lend it a greater sense of substance and weight um, to match sort of his, his idea of himself. And he also opened a land office in one wing, this kind of short squat wing in the foreground of the house, where he planned to sell tracts of land to his fellow New Englanders. Now that first New York investment failed within the space of a couple of years, but in the meanwhile, as he's kind of getting settled into this house, Phelps had invested in lands in Virginia, in Kentucky, in Vermont. He had invested in Shawnee and Delaware lands in the Ohio country, and Choctaw lands claimed by the state of Georgia. So Phelps was, he was speculating in land all across the new nation. And inspired by the promise of those schemes, in 1794, he actually doubled the house's size, bringing it to the size that you see here. He added intricate cabinetry, fine paneling, hundreds of yards of really like dazzling French wallpaper, which you can still see if you go there and visit it. And what I think is really amazing about all of this is that by that point, by 1794, Phelps had bought a lot of land, millions of acres of land, but he had as yet sold almost none of it. So he had accomplished all of this almost entirely on credit, you know, banking on the perception that his land investments were going to translate into inestimable amounts of wealth in the very near future. You'll probably be unsurprised to learn that they did not. Um, within a couple years of renovating his house, Phelps actually had to he had to lock in, lock himself inside of it to avoid being hauled off to debtor's prison. Eventually, he fled to Canandaigua, New York, where he lived out the rest of his days, evading his creditors and attempting to resuscitate his name and fortune. So the reason why I wanted to start with this house is because I think it stands as its own kind of monument a monument to certain faith in astronomical future success, a monument to the potential riches of Western lands, and most important, I think, a monument to the centrality of indigenous dispossession in the American founding. The book that I'm completing this year at, at Monticello, Speculation Nation, is a political and cultural history of Phelps's moment in time, of this tremendous enthusiasm for land speculation um, of which he was a part, a kind of wave that swept the new nation between US independence and the rise of the Jeffersonians. This was a period when it seemed like anybody with capital or access was getting involved in the land business, when speculators were buying and selling millions of acres of land at a bewildering rate, when fortunes were being won and lost apparently overnight. Contemporaries and historians alike have used a, a really intriguing language to describe this moment, this phenomenon. Um, they've called the land business in the founding era a rage, a ravaging flame, a mere drug, a mania. So simply put, the questions at the heart of my book 
try to uncover the methods behind this madness. And Jeanette, you can pull up the, the map now, please. Why did a maniacal market and expropriated land emerge during the 1780s and 90s? This is a map I've roughly compiled. It's a work in progress to try to show the extent of land speculation in this era. The darkly shaded regions represent places where governments signed contracts with speculators for lands numbering a million acres or more between 1787 and 1795. And then the kind of roughly hachured regions there represent places where land speculation was happening on a, on a more, a, a smaller scale. So why did a maniacal market emerge? How did capitalists and government officials forge a property regime in speculative land? And what does that process reveal about the outcome of the American Revolution? Now the book begins during and just after the Revolutionary War when the Republic was suffocating under kind of huge amounts of debt. And Congress and the states saw native land as a way to address that fiscal crisis, to kind of pay for the revolution without levying heavy taxes. But by reading land policies from across the new nation, what I found is that at first, revolutionaries tried to build a populist political economy of land, one that would exclude speculators and extend, instead sell expropriated land directly to white settlers. And the idea was to both fund governments and also to expand a society of yeoman farmers. But what I show during the book is that during the late 1780s and the early 1790s, states and the national government changed tax. This initial populist vision fell by the wayside, really, as governments became sort of addicted to the fiscal promise of massive land sales. And they started selling tracts of land to speculators, you know, with abandon and at really rock bottom prices. So the heart of this book follows land speculators in action, as I say, to try and understand that shift. I trace their strategies for lobbying and bribing governments, for uh, exploiting loopholes in land policies and in the money system. I try to reconstruct their attempts to make land profitable, to market the frontier ideal um, while waiting for land values to rise, to court European investors and potential migrants. And I examine how Native American resistance to US expansion prompted these people, both government officials and speculators, to launch a traffic in future rights to vast swaths of sovereign Indian country, kind of land futures, real estate that didn't even really exist yet, except in speculators' own imaginations. So this is a story of grand ambitions and base corruption. It's a story about the relationships between property and profit and revolution. And I hope that it's a story that sheds new light on the nation's founding, because ultimately what I'm trying to argue in this book is that land mania erupted when Americans cast the seizure and sale of native land as a basis of revolutionary state building. When they, when they made other people's land central to their efforts to kind of uh, fulfill the revolutionary promise, the revolutionary experiment. And for people like Oliver Phelps, that seemed like an opportunity worth staking a future upon, a, a sort of once in a lifetime chance to get in at the ground level and to invest in the revolutionary future of an American empire. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, no, I've always uh, generalized that Jeffersonian Republicans uh, were uh, keen to sell off land in smaller plots than their Federalist opponents. Uh, Jefferson spoke about an empire of liberty in which presumably he was not thinking about men like Phelps. I mean, Phelps is almost like one of these proprietors uh, created by the English monarchy in the 17th century, uh, and more land than he could possibly ever farm, um, massive uh, tracts, much of which just remain redundant uh, for decades. Uh, this presumably was not what Jefferson had in mind. Uh, what does your project tell us about his ideal of an empire of liberty? Thanks, Andrew. That's such a great question. So I have a I have a couple of uh, short answers to that. One is that so I would I would agree with the generalization um, if what we're doing is reading this scholarship because I do think that a lot of historians who have written about this topic before have really focused on 
federalists, capital F federalists as land speculators. But something I've found in researching and writing this book is that land speculation really was not an exclusively federalist vice. There's a whole lot of, um, of, of anti-federalists and eventually Jeffersonians um, who are involved in it to the exact same degree as, uh, as you know, your, 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 archetypical federalists like Robert Morris or like William Cooper. Um, so that's really surprising. Uh, when it comes to Jefferson himself, he, I have to say, also was not uniformly opposed to this. There's a moment in, this is actually a really important pivot in the course of the book. There's a moment in 1787 and 1788 when um, the Confederation Congress They've been building land policies for a long time that are trying to diminish land speculation. But eventually, for a number of reasons that I talk about in the book, they decide that they need to offload some pretty big chunks of land um, in order to address a looming fiscal crisis, a looming default, actually. Uh, and so in 1787 and 1788, Congress brokers private contracts with a number of speculators and land companies for something around 35 million acres of land northwest of the Ohio River. Um, Jefferson gets word of this, and his response is not what you'd think. Is not what you'd think. He actually says, you know that's not exactly what I was thinking about when I drafted the land ordinance a few years back, but it seems like this is pretty necessary. And so let's see how it works out. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that when it comes to strategies for apportioning land for white settlement, um, you know, it was a really kind of unstable spectrum of opinion and people kind of shifted uh, around as, as the years went on. When it comes specifically to Jefferson's idea of an empire of liberty, I think what my book is trying to say is that um, is that it became central to the financial economy of the late 1780s and the early 1790s. Jefferson's idea of you know a yeoman republic extending across formerly native space. This is something that historians have typically understood as the opposite of the world of speculative finance, right? Not a world of paper pushing and derivatives and securities, but um, but a world of virtuous yeoman farmers. Land speculators tried to build a system where the, the ideal of an empire of liberty was itself the very thing to be bought and sold in some ways. Uh, wasn't George Washington one of the major land speculators? Wasn't this the way he was making his wealth rather than the plantation of Mount Vernon? And one of the reasons that unlike most of the Virginia gentry who were in decline, in the early years of the 19th century, uh, he actually died uh, as he lived, an incredibly wealthy man, unlike Jefferson who went bankrupt, or even James Madison was bankrupt by the end of his life. Absolutely he was. And there's something kind of puzzling about this because um, a lot of Washington's land claims derived from his service as a as a you know a member of the British military during the Seven Years' War, and then some tracts that he acquired uh, early in the 1780s and in the mid 1780s. At the period, like at the heart of my book, when the land economy is really booming in the early 1790s, Washington's actually trying to get rid of his lands. He's like the one person in America who's trying to do that. And when I was a fellow at Mount Vernon, I got the chance to have a lot of uh, a lot of great conversations with different people around the library about this. Um, to try to understand what was going on. And I, I, I learned two possible answers. One from a fellow fellow named uh, Bruce Ragsdale, who suggested that maybe the reason why Washington was trying to get out of the land business was in order to channel profits from selling those tracts into his goal of making Mount Vernon a model farm, a model of agricultural improvement for mm -hmm. the new republic. Um, and Mary Thompson, um, the historian on staff at Mount Vernon uh, suggested an additional answer, which beautifully ties back to your conversation with with Alexi, which is that perhaps he was also trying to offload those tracts in present day West Virginia and Kentucky in order to raise the funds that would be necessary to purchase um, the enslaved people who came into the marriage who came to Mount Vernon through, uh, through Martha Washington in order to be able to secure their freedom. And am I, it's correct to say, is it not, that uh, the sales of these lands 
was the main form of government income. I mean, this is long before income taxes or really any form of direct taxes other than import uh, duties. This is a this is a tough question. I'm going to try to give the the really short answer and hope no, no hope nobody will hold me to it too tightly. Um, at the state level, because there are lots of states that claim frontier lands during this era, at the state level that could be true in a lot of cases. Pennsylvania is one instance that that springs immediately to mind. At the federal level, not so much. Initially national policymakers thought that that would be the case, thought that Western lands would be the main source of revenue. But it turns out not actually to be the case for the first out of 30 years or so, maybe even a little bit longer of the new nation. Um, after Hamilton's financial plan um, comes into effect, it's really the impost uh, the you know the collection of basically tariffs at the water's edge that funds the vast majority of the federal government. Land sales don't become they don't they don't follow up on their promise to become a major source of government income at the national level, really until after the War of 1812. And when does this mania end or does it end? I, know, I find it fascinating because we've seen all kinds of speculation subsequently and the earlier uh, famous, uh, you know, the daffodil speculation or the South Sea Company um, and, and land especially it's always been one of the quickest ways to make a fortune but also to lose a fortune. Mm -hmm. When does this um, when does this end? So the my chapter of the story that I'm trying to tell in this book really ends towards the end of the 1790s. There's a land bubble that, that, that this land bubble that I'm writing about kind of pops in 1796 and 1797, in large part because a lot of these speculators anticipated that they'd be able to flip huge tracts of land to European capitalists. That doesn't wind up panning out exactly as they'd hoped. Um, Europeans come to realize a lot faster than Americans do that frontier lands are sort of a dubious path to riches. So uh, the land bubble sort of pops towards the end of the decade, and what it means is that a huge number of the of the you know the early national elite find themselves either bankrupt or in debtor's prison. And Robert Morris is sort of one of the most famous examples. Yeah. After that, the land system evolves under the Jeffersonians um, with the creation of a new federal land office. And through that, land speculation kind of becomes channeled. It starts happening in smaller numbers. This era that I'm focusing on of million acre sales kind of ends. And instead, what you have is a greater portion of the US population participating in land speculation, but at a smaller scale. And that, that's when I think it kind of becomes just a normative part of the kind of mechanism of American expansion reaching into the 19th century. I'm glad you mentioned Robert Morris because I mean, he was the financial genius of the Revolutionary War and arguably he kept the war uh, viable um, in his uh, financial management and yet he personally went bankrupt. And I believe it is it not the case that Washington visited him in prison? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Um, I'm I'm not certain, um, but it wouldn't surprise me given their given their history, yes. right? And finally, because we're running out of time, does William Binghamton, after whom Binghamton in New York is named, uh, does he feature? Because uh, he's often listed as the wealthiest man in America by the turn of the century, um, and I've always been interested in him because he was involved in privateering in the French Caribbean during the Revolutionary War, which I mm. mentioned. The original source of his wealth uh, and his uh, his speculation, though, was not so much westward as northward into Maine and places. He's a he's a big part of my story. His land speculations yeah. in Maine, where he invests in about three million acres. He's also uh, really invested in Pennsylvania lands. Um, mm -hmm. It's surprising to me that he never really ends up the failure that Robert Morris did, because at one point William Bingham, Bingham floated the idea of purchasing all the land that was at market from Ohio to Maine, which is just like a, a dazzling amount of property. I think in part because he proved unable to do that, he managed to stay out of debtor's prison. <laughs> he also married very well to an Indian banker uh, and uh, played a major role in the negotiation of the Louisiana land session uh, in which Napoleon wouldn't trust 
the United States, but would trust an English bank would be behind it. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Michael. I'm sorry we can't continue this, but I now should uh, turn over to Kevin Butterfield, who I described earlier as my uh, counterpart uh, at Mount Vernon. Uh, his actual title is uh, Executive Director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington. He's also uh, author of The Making of Topville's America, Law and Association in the Early United States. And I can't resist mentioning, because it's always impressed me so much, uh, but he was a contestant in Jeopardy, which I would never submit myself to because I know how badly I would do on the spot if asked questions on television, especially ones of uh, general knowledge and current culture. But well, Kevin, you, uh, it, I admire you. And I'm doing well. Continue. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been exciting. I, I will say in the, in the great accolades that Alex Trebek received over the last few weeks uh, uh, of his unfortunate passing, uh, I was I was one of those people that got to tell personal stories of having met the guy on the set of Jeopardy, um, and uh, I am happy to say that I was a, a one day contestant on Jeopardy. So if anyone's watched the show, they know that that means I lost. Uh, but uh, but uh, yes, I was on the show, and I'm very proud of that. Well, thanks, Andrew. Thank let you. Me, uh, Kevin. Let me introduce uh, a couple of other. Uh, uh, fellows who will be joining us uh, for this remarkable session on emerging scholarship in the field. Uh, I also want to remind everyone that you can be entering in questions right now uh, for anyone that you've already seen or any of the presentations that you're about to see uh, into Facebook or YouTube, and we'll come to those in a moderated conversation at the end. Very briefly, I want to introduce Derek O'Leary as our next uh, panelist. Uh, he is, has finished his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and at, while at Berkeley, he worked on uh, really the Atlantic history, a broad picture of the emergence of historical societies, ways of understanding our own past and how um, really people like George Washington's memory was a big part of the work of, of men like Jared Sparks. I'm excited to talk with him more about this in front of you all. Uh, let me welcome Derek to the set. And Derek, I'm just going to hand things off to you, give you a chance to tell us a bit about your work, and then I'll ask a couple of questions. Yeah, I, I, I teach all day, every day of the week, so it's nice to have other people manage all the logistical and, and technical things. Um, so it's been really a pleasure to listen to a few of my peers tell me about their work. I've been trying to make some oblique connections, which I'll, I'll hope we can all talk about as a group. So my, my dissertation, um, and now in the marginal hours of the day, my book project, concerns those Americans who undertook to gather the ma historical materials that became the nation's first archive, a process which, as Kevin just said, played out in this much larger Atlantic context. Um, more fundamentally, they were concerned not just with gathering materials, but managing Americans' relationship with their past and sustaining those narratives that would be crucial to the formation of American identity. So. Uh, I had the great pleasure to be a fellow at Mount Vernon. And I want to talk about the part of my work that intersects with that institution and the memory of George Washington. So that brings us to Jared Sparks. It, it wouldn't be hard to argue um, that in this context of gathering historical materials and putting them use to use as narratives for the new nation, uh, that George Washington's materials were preeminent. Uh, any historical society would uh, be eager to acquire anything, a document, an artifact that linked them to George Washington. In the 19th century, Jared Sparks often monomaniacally took on the task of gathering and arranging and then editing, sometimes controversially, and then publish, publishing and, and preserving the vast written corpus of George Washington. Uh, and he did this mainly from the 1820s to the 1830s. Uh, the story really starts at Mount Vernon in 1827, where he gains access thanks to Judge Bushrod Washington, uh, descendant and uh, inheritor of Mount Vernon and Washington's papers themselves. Um, and over the next eight or 10 years or so, Sparks turns this huge amount of paper into 11 volumes of Washington's edited writing. Uh, as well as a biographical work. Uh, so these are just volumes of paper, but they have a big influence in a number of ways. It's these materials that other 
Americans, historians, and, and a broader population turn to to understand Washington. Edward Everett, uh, well known to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, uh, praised them and used them amply. Uh, Washington Irving, around the same time in his five volume biography of George Washington, uh, depended on them. So they, they had a big influence, um, and there's more to say about them. But the important thing, I think, is not to see the collection of these papers and the fascination with these papers uh, in isolation, but to see them within this broader context of antebellum Americans and other peoples, both domestically and abroad, who had something at stake in connecting with the, the legacy of George Washington, with gaining some sort of access to the man, with constructing some sort of image of him, with relating to this image and then putting it to use in different ways. And Sparks was one of those and an important one. But I want to place him in a slightly larger context. Um, and to do that, I'd just like to summon uh, James Fenimore Cooper, if we could go to that slide, please, uh, to cast a little bit of light on this broader context of how Americans engaged with the papers of George Washington and with the man in his memory uh, themselves. So this is, this is a funny little book. Um, I wouldn't rush out and get it, but James Fenimore Cooper authored it while he was nominally a U.S. consular officer in France, but really mostly gallivanting or loafing and, and writing um, at the same time. In the book, just so you understand what I'm about to read, uh, traces the story of two fictive uh, traveling partners, one an aristocratic European, the other uh, a good old Russian Yankee from New England, as they travel around the U.S. in the 1820s. Uh, so in this scene, it, it just so happens that this traveling duo has bumped into the Marquis de Lafayette uh, during the famous Frenchman's famous valedictory tour of the U.S. in 1824-1825. And they cross paths in D.C. and they all decide to go down to Mount Vernon for the day, where Lafayette's going to pay his respects at the general's tomb. And our, our two travelers are just going to check out the scenery. So I'm going to read. Uh, Hopefully you can you can see the the text on the screen, and I'll just raise this question beforehand: What are the ways in which these two individuals connect with the paper left behind by Washington? So, uh, we were shown into the gardens and greenhouses. So at Mount Vernon, in the latter, the domestic culled us a bouquet of hot house flowers, and turning to a box which lay at hand, he took a sheet of paper and enveloping their stems, presented them to my friend, Codwallader, the, the Yankee, received them thoughtfully. But his mind was too much occupied at the moment to attend to so trifling an occurrence. We had returned to the city, DC, and were at our late dinner when his eyes seemed riveted by some charm on the paper that had encircled this little offering. Scattering the flowers on every side of him, he laid the paper on the table and read its contents with breathless eagerness. It proved to be a sheet torn from a farming journal of the modern Cincinnati, so a popular way to refer to, to Washington, which had been kept in his own hand. The writing was distinct, though there were many technical abbreviations. The pages were without blot or erasure, and the precision of the language and the minuteness of the details were rigidly exact. The precious morsel was divided, and each of us took his portion, like men who were well content with the possession of some sacred relic. So there's a great deal to say about this that maybe others would, would observe in the conversation afterward. But I point to two things that connect us back to Sparks and this larger project of, of what to do with the nation's papers in this period. First thing is that Washington's papers, just this, this fragment of a farm journal, is a relic to the individuals, a sacred relic. And as we know about relics, you don't have to have the whole thing. It's okay to subdivide it because the purpose of a relic is not that it is intact, the intact thing, but that it brings you into touch with the person who created it, Washington. Second thing I would point out is what happens to this relic. The two individuals split it up and they go on their way. Uh, this is the opposite of archiving. The paper is unarchived. So in one sense, this might seem like the very opposite process of what Sparks is doing. Taking paper apart, running off with it, decentralizing it, at this moment when Sparks is obsessed 
from the same site at Mount Vernon, where he's actually working during this time with bringing Washington's materials together, making sense of them comprehensively and as a whole. And indeed, it's important to see this context of preservation as within a larger context of obliteration of historical materials, fragmentation of the historical record, loss of history. Um, but it also points to a common truth, both Cooper's characters and Sparks's actual labor, which is that Washington and Americans' access to Washington was deemed to be something of crucial importance in the antebellum period. And we can talk about why, but I'd say that the, the need to connect with Washington only mounts over the next few decades as Americans, North, South, everywhere else, uh, stumble towards civil war. And, and the idea of a national figure who could hold them all together um, became even more, more crucial. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to hearing from Kevin, I guess. That's great. Now, thank you, Derek. This is uh, fascinating stuff. And uh, again, everyone's going to have an opportunity to ask you some questions or, or to, to reflect on, on, on this, this, this subject. I, I wonder if you could uh, take us back. You, 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 you've given us a broader geographical context for this kind of work. Uh, but if you take us back in time in the 17th century or, or even before, was there this kind of work being done with the papers of or, or the, the, the remaining materials of great men in history? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I, there, there is a way in which there's continuity and there's a way in which there's disjuncture. Uh, the, the very notion of antiquarianism, of preserving materials like papers, emerges several centuries earlier, it's true, uh, mainly in the English context. And it, it's in the English context that you get the first institutions that are devoted to uh, maintaining collections of papers. Um, but we generally think of those people who collected and those, those papers as antiquarian. That is not necessarily part of the, those institutions or those individuals attempt to tell a narrative of change over time um, and one that would have a particular meaning for the nation in which it was taking place. This isn't, I mean, this is an exact, it's a, it's a partial answer to the question, um, but, but it's, so the, the practice of collecting papers has predated this, certainly, and in a way Americans are picking up on this older practice and these, these older, more venerable institutions in Europe. And like many things in, you know, uh, in the antebellum U.S., as you know, American institutions are far less developed and far less supported by, by the federal government or the state than their peer institutions in Europe. But there's also an important, there's an important disjuncture and change over time also, in that the very notion of the nation had changed by the 19th century. And to collect a fragment of paper in, I don't know, uh, 17th or 18th century uh, British colonies might have meant something different than in the new nation of the United States, where that, that a same slip of paper that uh, a historical society collected might be part of a much different sort of narrative, a narrative of, I mean, a narrative that links with what Professor Blackman just told us about, this expansion of American empire westward across the continent. That piece of paper could be part of that larger story uh, in a way that it couldn't be part of that story before. Um, so. Uh, change and continuity is that, that makes total sense, and I, I'm, I'm glad I asked because I, I, that that helps me contextualize this. I I'm, I wonder to uh, what a, a Jared Sparks uh, believes that he's contributing to the world uh, with these eleven. He said eleven volumes coming out of Sparks, right? Um, so if I were to embark on something like this today or, or write a grant application to try to do something like this, I would be talking about what other scholars would do with this work that I will be making these materials available and others will, will use it and, and consult it and come to new conclusions about our past. Did Jared Sparks have a similar uh, mentality about it? Or what does he believe that he's bequeathing to the world with those 11 published volumes? Yeah, I, I really like the question. I, I have two types of answers. One is that after reading, having read all of, I think, Jared Sparks' uh, journals and preserved personal writing, he demonstrates a certain like absence of interiority, which you can actually find in a lot of other collectors of, of documents in this period. He don't really, he doesn't necessarily betray too much what he what he feels or thinks is going on. So it can be hard to penetrate to an extent. But but the other more direct answer is that he perceived that this is a definitive work, 
Uh, he regularly in his writing refers to his work on Washington, all these papers, thousands of papers that he's gone through and edited and arranged. He refers to them as a monument. And you don't, you don't change monuments. Well, you do change monuments, right? But then there, there can be good reason. But like uh, at the time, you saw it as a finished product. Uh, and he was accused of like polishing some of the rougher edges of Washington. When he shows up in scholarship till today, he's usually as a footnote, as the guy who kind of like uh, bold, boldlerized a little bit Washington's writing. But it, but in part, that's because he saw it as like a monument for all Americans to refer to and for other historians to stand on, um, something definitive. I would say he also saw it as the foundation of a national archive, which is what it became in a sense. Uh, in the 1830s, the US uh, Congress appropriated $25,000 to buy all of the papers that Sparks had been working on that were then in Washington's family's collection. And those became the first major acquisition by the federal government of historical papers, a full century before we actually get a US National Archives in this country. Right, right. So he was, he was on the cutting edge in a way, as far as uh, that goes. Well, let me, I'm gonna go to our, 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 our fourth and final uh, presenter in just a minute, but let me ask one very short question, hopefully get a, a short answer. Uh, I'm curious about um, the, the Cooper story that you tell of the, the scrap of paper. Um, I've seen George Washington's handwriting many, many times working at the library, and so I would recognize it right away. I'm curious how others would have recognized George Washington's handwriting if they hadn't previously had access to his papers. Are, are they reprinted or facsimiles uh, circulating in newspapers? How would one have identified his handwriting so quickly? Yeah, awesome question. I'll try to give a short answer. One they probably wouldn't have, and a lot of his writing was actually transcribed by his, his staff uh, after, you know, upon his instruction. So they probably wouldn't have. But what's really happening is, is projection. Uh, if you recall the the quote from Cooper, they refer to the the like the spotlessness and the perfection of the writing, which was mm. supposed to be, and Sparks believed this as well, a reflection of the perfection and the balance, these classical ideals that people held of the man. So it, it's very much, you know, the Washington's perfection was in the eye of the believer, and it could be read in his his script. The, I, I won't talk about like cryptology and, and stuff, but like also people people believe that one's script was a reflection of their character in this. In this uh, yeah. Well, let's uh, uh, let's go to uh, Kristen Blackstone now uh, and uh, have one more conversation before we open it up to audience questions. Um, uh, Kristen Blackstone is a native of, of Northern Maine, an American, but is in the final year of her PhD program at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, she was a research fellow at the Washington Library, has done some remarkable work on the morale uh, problem with the Continental Army in, during the Revolutionary War uh, from 1775 until 83. Uh, I wonder, uh, Kristen, if you're ready for us. Uh, you're far away and in the dark. Um, uh, it's dark outside. I can see you just fine. But I, uh, tell us about your work, and then let me ask you a few questions when you have a minute. Great. Well, thank you to Mount Vernon and to Monticello. Um, for inviting me to speak, and then my fellow panelists for speaking already. I really enjoyed listening to your papers. Um, morale is one of those words that is thrown around a lot. People use it all the time, and actually, especially during the pandemic, it's a word that's come up in the news often. Um, and I find morale tends to be used as a broad, negative assessment of a group of people. And when people think of Continental Army soldiers, they tend to think of that Valley Forge image in their mind and therefore low morale. Um, what comes to people's mind is this snowy scene where soldiers look cold and they don't have shoes. Their uniforms are tattered and someone probably has, you know, a bandage over their head. Um, but morale isn't quite so easily understood. Uh, so my project, I define morale as the willingness and ability of an individual or a group to endure the hardships of war. And morale is derived from a number of factors on and off the battlefield. And although some difficulties of war are universal and exist in all conflicts, many of the hardships are defined by specifics of the conflict and a soldier's position in it because morale is culturally influenced. So in my research, I rely really heavily on soldiers' diaries and journals written during the war. The more than 300 diaries I've studied reflect the unique experience of war and its monotony, its hardships, and really illuminates the diversity of soldiers' experiences. Um, although soldiers rarely explain their motivation for keeping a diary, the content of the diaries themselves, no matter how brief, 
and the regularity that soldiers wrote in them shows just how important they were. So as a concept, morale was first conceived of and written by a French military theorist in 1757 after seeing an experienced group of soldiers inexplicably retreat during a battle that they should have won quite easily. The theory that emerged from witnessing this was that there was, and I quote, sufficient proof of the changeable quality of the human heart. So previously, negative reactions to combat were considered cowardice or a character flaw on the part of the soldiers who retreated. But this consideration of the human heart was in many ways a precursor to military psychology that emerges in the 20th century and is the earliest record of a theorist concern over morale, even if he doesn't actually call it morale. So in 1774, about 15 years later, a textbook was circulated um, in English around the colonies that argued the exact same thing and focused a lot on the human heart. Because the Continental Army was created in 1775, it was the first army to consider soldiers' morale as instrumental to the army's success. And this really aligned particularly well with the revolutionary character of the war. Um, officers needed to convince the enlisted soldiers that as individual citizens, they were worthy of the utmost status and honor because they fought in the revolution. So I break my consideration of morale into three areas foundational morale, sustaining morale, and then expressions of morale, and I'll give a brief overview of each of them. So by foundational morale, I mean the institution of the Continental Army itself. The foundation of the Continental Army, as I already said, is really important, and it fits within these larger patterns of 18th century military developments. Um, but key to morale is the culture and society surrounding the army. So perceptions regarding military service in the colonies really affect soldiers' sense of duty and the expectation of service. But it also affects practical things like their willingness to enlist for longer terms of service. By longer, I just mean more than six months. Similarly, the Continental Army was purposely defined by the limits of its power, and thus the relationship between officers and Congress dictated much of the conflict. Because of this, tensions emerged regarding expectations. There was a fundamental divergence in the perception and understanding of morale between soldiers and the officers and Congress. So to bridge this gap, in addition to very practical military training, leaders spent a lot of the time in the war educating soldiers on why they were fighting. Um, in many ways, officers defined the conflict for the enlisted soldiers. Um, they routinely attempted to foster unity and impressed upon the soldiers that all of the colonies and all of the people within them were united in the cause, even if this wasn't necessarily true. If the institutional structure of the army provided a foundation for concern over morale and the ways that it was fostered, it was the relationships that soldiers had with one another and with the civilian populations that sustained their participation in the conflict. So the experience of soldiering during the Revolutionary War was unique. Common soldiers especially really believed their experience of war was incomparable to the officers and that civilians were completely incapable of understanding the hardships that they endured. The bond that these soldiers fought, uh, forged from their shared experiences were critical to the maintenance of the army. And if bonds between soldiers kept them within the army ranks, then civilians acted as a tangible manifestation of why soldiers fought. Life in the army shaped soldiers' self-perceptions. So soldiers came to understand their enlistment as a public service. And by defining their service in such a way, soldiers created this inextricable tie between morale and civilians. On a practical level, the army relied heavily on civilian populations for supplies and shelter, but also support and affection from civilians were of the utmost importance to soldiers and acted as an affirmation of their duty whereas scorn from civilians had a truly debilitating effect. Although I don't try to measure morale in my project, and I, I largely don't think it would be possible to measure morale, um, mutiny and desertion are two expressions of dissatisfaction that I can examine. Essentially, they exist as two halves of the morale question. So if morale, as I said earlier, is a combination of willingness and ability, Desertion reflects a blatant unwillingness to continue enduring the war, whereas mutiny demonstrates the limits of soldiers' endurance. Mutiny and desertion occurred at different times and affected different groups of soldiers, which is quite unique to the Continental Army, actually. 
Um, so soldiers most frequently deserted within the first six months of their service in the absence of those regimental bonds that I mentioned earlier. But mutinies relied on those regimental bonds and the coherence that they brought safeguarded the soldiers during the mutinous action. Um, to give you an idea of some statistics, desertion rates fluctuated greatly throughout the war, but on average, 13.7% of the army deserted every year. That averages out to approximately 200 soldiers per month or an entire company every month. Desertion occurred most frequently during periods of change, um, either actual reorganization of army structures or when enlistment cycles were ending. Mutinies early in the war tended to be struggles over authority, whereas later in the war, mutinies acted instead as an expression of a particular grievance. So a lack of pay, no clothing, adequate, not adequate supplies. Um, mutiny tended to be a last resort of soldiers when they felt that they had no other option to address their problems, but didn't want to leave the army itself. Considering mutiny and desertion, of course, doesn't give a definitive measurement of morale by any means but it does expose patterns of dissatisfaction, which are key to understanding morale more generally. Um, I'll end on this anecdote. Uh, it's, it's the favorite joke of everyone I talk to about my project when I say I'm researching morale of the Continental Army to respond very quickly with, oh, that's easy, morale was low. Um, and while they aren't wrong, I hope what you've just heard and what I hope to explain further in my discussion with Kevin and the rest of the panelists goes to show that morale is slightly more complicated than simply something that can be measured in low or high. Overall, I think to understand the Revolutionary War and its outcomes, it's crucial to understand those who fought in it. And the goal of my research is to get a better understanding of why these Continental Army soldiers fought and continued to fight during the war. Thank you, Chris. This is amazing. I, I, I want to just ask a couple of, of, of short questions and, and bring us to the panel discussion pretty quickly. Uh, the first one that comes to mind for me is actually building on uh, what Derek was discussing, and that is the archival record. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned reading 300 and some odd diaries. Uh, I, I wonder if you could just talk to us a little bit about why these have survived. Uh, were these considered precious from the moment of the uh, of the, the last shot of the war? Um, or and what can you tell us about that preservation and, and how they've uh, been preserved up, to, up until your opportunity to read them? Yeah, so they've been preserved in a, a really interesting variety of ways. Um, in terms of their importance from kind of the moment the war started to the individual soldiers that kept them, they were extremely important. And um, they write in them regularly. There's multiple soldiers who write religiously every day, even if it's just, I walked four miles, full stop. Actually, they don't even say I walked, they just put four miles, full stop. Um, and so to the soldiers, it's really important. After the war, I would imagine soldiers kept them just as a record of their service, but they become incredibly important when it comes to pension applications. So actually lots of them have been preserved in the pension application records. And um, you can go online on the National Archives and see pension applications and soldiers as evidence of their service will attach their diaries. Um, and so there's 73 diaries that have been scanned into the pension application records at the National Archive, um, which is really fascinating to read, especially in the context of pension applications more generally. Um, a lot of historical societies in the 19th century thought it was really important to both preserve these diaries, but also to remember the history so you see the Massachusetts Historical Society in the 19th century, they used to read out diaries during their meetings as just a, we're going to do this today. And then there's, you know, records of reading out Ebenezer Wilde's diary from July, 1775 until the end of the year. Um, and then I think also just lots of people and individual families have kept them and they've ended up in various archives kind of scattered across the US, which is always fun to see. That's fascinating. I'm glad I asked that. And there's this other question that, that has come to mind uh, in hearing about your work both years ago and now. Uh, it's the famous adage that generals are always sort of preparing for the last war, right? That, that they had, they, they've learned a lot of lessons from previous conflicts uh, that they carry with them into whatever comes next. And I wonder, were there lessons learned in the Revolutionary War that were useful for the U.S. Army in incarnations to come, say the War of 1812 or thereafter? Uh, and how did they how did they come to those lessons? I think so. Um, so certainly the Continental Army is interesting because I think on the one hand, in terms of American society, it really gets people used to the idea of an army. Um, so there isn't really a, a full standing army. 
that stays in periods of peace until much later into the 19th century. It's something that kind of leaves and come back with very small regiments that kind of stay in place. Um, but in terms of training and tactics, that certainly stays. So von Steuben's Blue Book is something that is referenced all of the time and that kind of carries out. Um, the training regimen in the Continental Army beyond von Steuben was kind of created specifically for the soldiers that fought in it. And I think there's elements of that that continue. So whether it's specifically from the Revolutionary War or if it's just the shift that happens in the 18th century more generally, I'm not sure. Um, but there's a real shift in focus on individual soldiers and making sure that everyone's movements are precise, um, because if everyone's movements are precise, then the army as a whole is going to function better. So there's a lot more focus on individuals rather than just, this is a group of people, hopefully they're all doing something right. Um, and so that develops. But I think during the Revolutionary War, obviously, as I said, and it's very important to my thesis, so I say this all the time, because the Continental Army was founded in 1775 at the beginning of the war, they spend most of the war just trying to figure out what they're doing. So they're constantly restructuring and they're constantly reorganizing and they're always trying to figure out new ways to train soldiers and convince soldiers to stay in the fight and telling soldiers what they're fighting for. And so I think a lot of that, um, that that's really the focus. It's not necessarily coming up with a particular military style so much as it is just finding something that means they're all going to be okay. Thanks so much, Kristen. Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, this has been a wonderful uh, half of, of our event and Andrew's conversation for the first half was remarkable. Let's bring it all together. Uh, and I'm going to hand things off to Jim Ambusky now and let Jim ask some questions of all of you. Jim? Kevin, thank you very much. Well, thanks uh, to all of you for an excellent series of conversations. I've enjoyed learning uh, a lot about your projects and judging by the comments that have been coming in on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, uh, our audience members have as well. I wanna ask you a couple of big picture questions to kind of round out our evening together. And, and my first question is really inspired in part by Kevin's discussion with Derek, but also uh, from some comments and questions that came in from Hannah Cussworth from London and Donald Johnson from North Dakota. And that's thinking about the extent to which you see your projects uh, as, and the histories and the stories that you're telling as seeing more continuity versus change. I mean, we, we like to think of the revolution as this big dramatic break from the colonial period into the early Republic. Uh, but I was uh, struck by some of the things you were saying over the course of our time together, uh, that there might be some instances where there's a stronger impulse for uh, more continuity from the colonial period into the early Republic than there was a kind of dramatic break. And so actually, Michael, if we could start with you in thinking about land speculation and perhaps then move to Kristen to thinking about the military aspect of that question uh, and turn to Alexi then to think about gender and law in that equation and then finish with Derek, uh, who helped inspire this question in the first place. So Michael, what say you? So I see I see a story of initial rupture followed by long continuities, basically. Um, I think uh, the... You know, one of the one of the main things about the early American land business is that it was rooted in a legal culture that had been developed across, you know, at least a century and a half of British colonization in North America, and that had served colonists in a lot of ways um, pretty well. So, you know, there's you don't have to create an entirely new body of law in order to make a land business in the new American Republic. What you do need is a change of policy, and this is something that historians like Woody Holton have. Um, have discussed in previous scholarship. It's it's something that I try to add to in the book I'm working on. Towards the end of the British colonial period, as part of its series of reforms following the Seven Years' War, the British Empire really adopted a program of attempting to limit settler expansion and attempting to limit land speculators' abilities to profit off that expansion. Um, and so, like you know, you read the papers of um, colonial land companies and speculators, and they're just they're just so distraught because they want an ally in London, but instead um, British ministers are kind of constantly obstructing their attempts. This contributes to the rationale for independence, right? It's it shows up in the Declaration of Independence, where one of the one of the grievances is about King George III raising the conditions for new appropriations of lands. So the New Republic is kind of founded with a mandate to support settler expansion. Um, and I think with that change in policy combined with the pre-existing legal culture, uh, 
that's the that's the rupture that I see. But it but it paves the way for for decades and centuries of expansion to come. Well, that's extremely helpful. Thank you very much, Michael, for helping me think through that. And Kristen, what about the military context? As you said, the Continental Army is a new thing, and it's barely holding itself together, uh, especially in very trying times during the war. What do you, what do you see towards that question? I mean, it's interesting because obviously I just gave you know a seven minute talk about how morale is really at the forefront of military development and the Continental Army is the first army that's able because they don't have that institutional baggage um, to incorporate it into their systems. But having said that, and I, that is true, um, actually the Continental Army, and I can't stress this enough, tries really hard to emulate the colonial British Army and other old regime European armies at that time from the seven, partly because the military, the limited military experience that officers in the Continental Army have were from their service in the British Army or in very small militias. Um, and the British Army was an army that functioned very well. It was extremely successful. And so for most of the Revolutionary War, certainly at the very beginning, George Washington and other officers are constantly trying to emulate the old military tactics and they're constantly trying to turn this group of people who are relatively inexperienced to a professional standing army. And the way they do that is they copy other armies that already existed. So there's lots of continuity there. If you look at the articles of war that they write in 1775, it's basically copied verbatim from the British. Um, there's very few changes at all. Um, so there is a lot of continuity in terms of military training and how they structure the armies with some modifications um, for specific continental army units. But in general, there's a ton of continuity between the colonial period and the continental army. Sometimes if it ain't broke, don't fix it, I suppose. Well, Alexi, let's think about this from the, the standpoint of gender and law. I mean, the army, uh, armies are sort of a, traditionally thought of as a very masculine thing, but you're dealing with uh, women in your story who are property owners in their own right. And some choose not to marry, I would suspect, in part to retain control of that property. But they straddle each side of the American Revolution. Are you seeing uh, in the development of law in colonial Virginia into early Republican Virginia then a change over time? Or is it more of the same kind of thing? So when it comes to these women, these elite women's engagement with commercial culture and the law, I'd actually see much more continuity than I do change, simply because Married Women's Property Acts were not enacted um, until the 1840s and 50s and on. And what those are, are enabling women who get married to still keep property in their own name, right? That's generally how we experience property ownership today. Um, but before that, of course, as I was saying earlier, you are a femme sole or a femme covert. If you're a femme covert, you're married, uh, technically, legally, your property, your earnings fell under your husband's um, legal ownership. And so Virginia was actually one of the last states to pass their Married Women's Property Act, and that was in 1870. And the very first state, Mississippi, to pass it was in 1839. So we're talking about a period uh, with my women that are experiencing the same kind of um, restrictions on their property ownership as they experienced in the colonial period, right? So we do see that continuity. What is interesting is the question of why did these Married Women's Property Acts eventually get passed? And it's easy to look at that and say, well, maybe it's budding feminism or a, a, a young sense of women's independence and marriage, but actually no, it has to do with capitalism and insolvency. So, you know, after, during the New Republic uh, era, we have kind of intensifying capitalism, much more so than in the colonial period. And with that, of course, becomes booms and busts and more families are going into debt. Now, before Married Women's Property Acts, a creditor could come after a wife's property because it belonged to the man if the man was in debt and all the family would be ruined because all property would be taken, right? But if women are able to keep property in their own name, even after marriage, thanks to these acts, then if a husband goes into debt and a creditor comes after the family, the creditor can only now take the husband's property instead of the wife. So it actually secures the American family much more uh, in that way. So the women I'm dealing with, with their engagement in commercial culture, it's actually quite similar to the pre-revolutionary era. How does the American Revolution change these women's lives? Very much on a personal level. 
So with Kate Flood McCall, she was a young child when her loyalist father, Archibald, was found out and they had to flee to um, Britain. And she was raised in an Enlightenment era European boarding schools at the time. And then she came back when she was 19 years old, they were able to petition and come back. And then she was able to use her uh, grandfather's inheritance to reintegrate as a child of a former loyalist into this community. Um, we also have Annie Henry Christian, right? She married the friend of her brother, Patrick Henry, who was a land speculator, very similar to, very similar to characters that Michael is talking about in his work. Uh, her husband, Colonel William Christian, was a revolutionary war hero and land speculator, right? And so her, her wealth, her family's wealth, exploded because of the Revolutionary War, right? And then, of course, we have Martha Washington, and you can imagine how her life changed by being married to George Washington. I'm not going to go into that. I think you can think why that would be. So on a personal level, of course, the American Revolution is affecting all people, including my women who are Americans in Virginia. But when it comes to their legal status and their ability to own or not own property and their own name, no, I see much more continuity for them. Well, that's that's very helpful. And actually, something you said uh, inspires me to ask uh, Derek a, a slightly different question, Will, in the same vein. But you, you said that Catherine was raised in a sort of Enlightenment era Europe uh, in the, you know, the mid 18th century. And Derek, when you were talking with Kevin, I was struck by uh, some of the discussion about European sources and influences on the ways in which early Americans thought about uh, constructing archives, venerating the past, constructing historical memory. Um, so in, in that vein then, it, it, where do you see this uh, this question of, of change and continuity uh, coming down? Do you see it? Uh, I think you answered it a little bit in your discussion with Kevin, but I I, I want more. Give me more. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, like, I like your appendix to the question. It's actually really helpful um, for, for my response. Uh, so the urge to preserve historical materials, and I'm saying materials because it, it's paper primarily, but it's artifacts too. It's a shoe pierced by a bullet in this battle. As Brian Page points out in the in the comments, it could be a lock of hair, which was a thing uh, that people definitely did, and there's more to say about it. Um, that urge to preserve, and I think this will be intuitive to all of us, uh, it's historically contingent. Whether we preserve something or not depends upon our sense of whether it matters or not, and also on our sense of its perishability, its vulnerability. And both of these things were in flux around the time of the revolution in the early US. The, the first um, calls to preserve materials came during Kristen's period in the revolution when uh, materials were literally being destroyed. His, uh, colonial documents were being destroyed in the context of the war. And this is where you get the first calls for archives to be formed. But it's, it's not really until about 50 years after the revolution ignites that we get the flurry of new historical societies and a much larger culture of collecting. And, and why is that? Um, because it's, uh, things have changed. A, a sense of the, the destiny of the United States uh, beyond the War of 1812 has changed. Nationalism has, has grown. The, the sense of the trajectory of American history is different and it's more ambitious. Uh, other things have changed too. The revolutionary generation is, is dying out. People are literally watching Jefferson, Adams, et cetera, uh, die out. And to connect with Alexi's comment a bit, um, a lot of the people who then fall into possession of, of documents are widows uh, or children, women, who are girls who are children of, of these uh, dying revolutionary men. And they play a role in the formation of archives too. But to connect this with Europe, um, Americans believed that their revolution and their nation was exceptional, which meant that the papers that documented the history, past, present, future of this nation were exceptional too. Uh, and so they regularly distinguished their archival project from those going on in Europe. And, and there's a difference which is familiar. It's like, it's part of Kevin Butterfield's scholarship to that world that any individual could contribute to an archive, to a historical society in the early US and many did, which was just not really the case in Europe, that they were these sort of crowdsourced mm -hmm. um, projects. Let's, that's terrific and thank you very much. And I've got one final question and actually speaking of the future, uh, this question comes to us in part from uh, Frank Cogliano, uh, a good friend of Mount Vernon and Monticello out there at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and Kristen, we'll, we'll start with you because Frank's your advisor and so you get first dip. But Frank was was uh, uh, wondering and several other people were too, or what are the biggest challenges and opportunities that 
the rising generation of early American scholars faced. Uh, and you can take that wherever, which way you want to. So Kristen, we'll start with you. And then, you know, I, I think we can go to Alexi, Michael, and uh, Derek to finish it off. Um, I think I'm going to stick with the opportunities part of that question. It sounds like more fun and slightly more optimistic. <laughs> so I think one of the great opportunities is we are very much in the digital age. And so increasingly, and actually even more so in the last nine months, because people physically cannot go to archives right now, there's just so much more material available online than there ever has been before. And the accessibility of all of these new sources make things a lot, a lot easier, it makes research a lot easier. It really broadens out the different topics that people can look at and the ways in which they can look at it. I don't think my project and the focus on diaries that I have could have been done as, it wasn't easy to do, but with the ease that I found all of the material even 15 years ago. Um, it was much easier for me to just kind of look online and email different historical societies who graciously scanned documents for me. I mean, I live in Scotland. I don't live in the U.S. And while I've done archival research trips in the U.S., I, I do have to do most of my work here. And so um, I think future generations and the generations of scholars right now really have lots more opportunities and the types of questions that they can ask um, can really be expanded because of how many sources are going to be digital from here going forward. Yeah, it's certainly a great plug for the digital age, certainly, especially in a moment like this. Yeah. Alexi? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I won't repeat too much of what Kristen said because I completely agree with everything she said. Just sitting here and thinking about opportunities for future scholars, especially of early America, I think um, early American historians have never been so uh, popular in the public eye right now with American politics. And so we have uh, a nation in crisis very much so right now in 2020 for a variety of ways. And people are thinking about and turning to, has this happened before? What groups of people are oppressed right now? Which ones are not? Why are some people angry about what? And what are the roots of this in American history? And so I think that I, I'm hopeful, this is like a silver lining of the uh, terribleness of 2020. I'm hopeful that new rising scholars will take advantage of this time period and make a silver lining from it and say, I'm inspired by this turmoil and I wanna find the roots of something that we haven't discovered yet that will help explain some future moment of turmoil. So I'm hoping that there are opportunities for inspiration for future scholars out of out of strife. No, I think it's a great lesson and a, and a great point that a lot of the questions we often ask about the past are reflections of what we're seeing in the present. And so, Michael, what are you seeing in Princeton that inspires you, and where do you hope that early American scholars can go in the future? So, well, I'd absolutely echo Kristen's and Alexi's points. I think especially the point about digitization. On, on, on Monday, I got to spend the day reading the papers of Rufus Putnam, which are at Marietta College. And normally to do that would be a three-day endeavor, and it would probably cost 1500 bucks, planes, trains, automobiles, and hotels included. But I got to do it without putting shoes on. That was, <laughs> that was magnificent. Um, so I, I'd like to add one one challenge and one opportunity, and I, I'll start with a challenge that I don't end on a on a sour note. Um, so I think something that um, that all of us have been noticing during during our time in our our, our our academic training, something that's certainly on the minds of the graduate students that I work with here at Princeton is the fact that universities are hiring fewer historians mm -hmm. nowadays, in large part because of a declining emphasis on humanities education, um, which I think has so much to offer our world for itself, for, for, for what we know about ourselves and about our past, but also for individuals looking to build careers. I mean, the things that you can, the skills that you can master in practicing history, in addition to just learning the history, the ability to read and understand evidence and make arguments based upon it and the ability to become a good writer and to learn how to argue and persuade people. These are foundational things. And so I think I would say to our, our, our audience today, please encourage the young people you know to study history. Um, tell them why you think it's important and what you think it can do for them. And also uh, write to your state legislators and encourage them to support uh, 
um, higher education and history education in particular in public university systems and continue to support places, magnificent places like Monticello and Mount Vernon. Um, I think that's just absolutely essential for, for our field to continue making the discoveries that it can make. And quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll say what I think a great opportunity is, and that's that our ideas about, as a field, as a, as a community of scholars, our ideas about what and where and who counts as early American history have been expanding dramatically over the last few decades. Sometimes, sometimes I feel that this is painted as something of a zero sum game. Either we're thinking about Washington and Jefferson, or we're thinking about all of these other topics that historians have been spending more time on recently. But I really think that's mistaken, because I think the promise of expanding what counts as early American history is that it prompts new questions and then new discoveries about, you know, what we have traditionally thought of as the core narratives of the American past. So I think an expanding idea of what early America is floats all boats. Well, a rising tide does lift all, all boats, and I'm certainly on board with that. Uh, Derek, take us home then, because uh, a lot of the people in your story created the archives that we, we uh, rely on. And so where do you see as uh, some of the challenges and opportunities facing folks who want to study early American history? Yeah, I, I, I will echo and follow Michael's pos uh, negative followed by positive, so as not to, to end on a negative. Um, I, I mean, two outstanding challenges. Michael captured them very well. Uh, the crisis of the university is our crisis to defunding, especially of state universities like UVA or UC Berkeley, where I went. Um, and then a broader cultural crisis of people not trusting universities. And the, the scholarship that we're producing is new and disturbing, and we all have to work on that. I mean, a, a challenge which I think is easier to deal with is one of uh, graduate education, which is something I care a lot about. And what are we, in fact, training early Americanists to do beyond the PhD, especially if tenure track jobs or jobs in big institutions um, like Mount Vernon don't actually exist for the majority of us. Um, that's a challenge I think we can deal with well and a lot of places are. Um, positive thing, I taught a bunch of ninth graders today about the 1776 mission of Mohawk leader Joseph Grant to Britain where he petitioned the king and we read the letter and they translated the letter into tweets uh, and they got wow. it. And like they were interested. And I, my point is like the stuff that we do is translatable to people um, and it's re relevant to people. And um, I think that's exciting. So uh, I, feel, I feel optimistic about that. We're not barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a hopeful place to end it. Thank you all very much, Derek Lealy, uh, Kristen Blackstone, Michael Blackman, Lexi Garrett. Uh, this has been terrific. Our audience has enjoyed this immensely. Uh, and thank you all very much for taking the time uh, and to share your talent with us today. I uh, just want to quickly thank uh, Andrew O'Shaughnessy and Kevin Butterfield for their time as well today, as well as Whitney Pippen and Jeanette Patrick, who are behind the scenes. Thanks to all of you who have joined us for this evening. Uh, from all of us at Monticello and Mount Vernon, have a happy and safe Thanksgiving and come back and see us anytime. <laughs>